Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sean Horseman, Director of Planning and Development for Bronxboro President Vanessa Gibson. On behalf of Bronxboro President Vanessa Gibson, I'm pleased to welcome you to this public hearing. It is being held today, Wednesday, November 29th, 2023, at 851 Grand Concourse, Room 711, at, starting at 2.09 p.m. I'll now turn it over to Bronxboro President Vanessa Gibson to welcome you. Thank you, thank you to Tom, and thank you to the Office of the Bronx Mall President, uh, our planning and development team. Thank you to Tom and Kimberly and Jaden and Sam and the entire team, our community boards unit, Kira, Tom, Alexis, and Kenny. Thank you to Bronxnet for being here, as well as the Department of City Planning. I am Bronx Mall President Vanessa L. Gibson, and I'm grateful to be here for this important opportunity to speak about Mayor Eric Adams' administration and the City of Yes proposal, which is now before us. As the borough president, I take great pride and privilege in recognizing that the Bronx is a borough of opportunities. We are a global destination from our historic landmarks. We are the greenest borough. We have a lot of promise and potential across our borough. Neighborhoods that have often not seen development and economic activity this proposal is an opportunity to talk about the landscape of our borough, the infrastructure of our borough, and how we come to a balanced position that recognizes the value of jobs, career pathways, stimulating the economy, supporting minority and women-owned businesses, supporting our entrepreneurs, commercial activity, recognizing the value of street vendors, of our business improvement districts, working with our stakeholders that proudly represent this great world. We have worked so hard over the course of our administration, just a year, 11 months, and 29 days, but who is counting? And we pride ourselves in making sure that our agenda is one of ambition, one of intention, and one of purpose. Our economic development arm of our office, the BX Economic Development Corporation, we also call BXEDC, led by President Rob Walsh, and his team are doing tremendous work, working with the state, working with the federal government, tapping into money that often was not on the table for us, we pride ourselves in saying that we do not want to leave any money on the table. So we're expending millions of dollars in small business loans, grant opportunities, access to capital for our small businesses, for our entrepreneurs, and we're looking at many of our capital projects from the perspective of equity, fairness, and revitalizing our economy. Just yesterday, State Controller Tom DiNapoli came to our borough with his economic snapshot of the South Bronx and the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center. And what we have learned over the last decade in our borough is that we are growing, we are creating more jobs, we're boosting the economy. We have seen historic gains in many of our industries, in healthcare, in housing, in economic development, we're looking at life sciences, we're looking at STEM and STEAM, and we are really a part of revitalizing this great borough. This cannot happen without partnership. And recognizing Mayor Eric Adams and his administration, we have to make sure that we are prepared for the next 50 years. So I'm grateful that in our highest day during the COVID pandemic, we were at 25.6% of unemployment. And now today, we're at 6.5. So you cannot tell me that the Bronx is not moving in the right direction. And how do we take that to the next level? How do we look at creative and innovative approaches to our existing infrastructure, thinking outside of the box, and realizing that the Bronx is the place to live, to work, to do business, and raise our families. So we are excited about the opportunities that lie ahead. We're excited about working with the administration and the Department of City Planning. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we are creating the access and opportunities that so many of our residents and families and businesses rightfully deserve and need here in our borough. So I'm grateful to be here. Commercial activity is truly a fundamental part of our work. It's a part of our community. Supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs is something that we are absolutely supportive of. And I look forward to discussing the proposal before us on economic development, cutting red tape, 
reducing redundancy and making sure that we are standardizing the process, but also enhancing opportunities for our small businesses here in the Bronx. So thank you so much for being here and we look forward to today's public hearing. Yeah, wonderfully said, thank you, Mayor President. Uh, I will now go over the run of show and set the ground rules for the public hearing. First, uh, for the public hearing, the applicant will make an initial presentation. The borough president's team will then ask questions to the applicant team. Any elected officials that are present may then offer testimony. Statements from the general public will begin in the order they're received. There's a two minute time limit which will be enforced. The applicant team will not respond to questions after individual speakers. The speakers will be both in person and virtual. To speak in person, you'll need to fill out a speaker card available at the sign-in table when you first arrived. To speak virtually, you will need to use the raise hand function on the Teams chat, uh, which will put you into the queue. Uh, if you're unable to use the raise hands, just make a note, a comment in the uh, Teams as well, and that will identify it. If you're on a phone, you can press star five to raise or lower your hand, and you can press star six to mute, unmute yourself when you're called upon. Please only unmute yourself if you have been recognized to speak. Speakers may only speak once, and we ask that there are no interruptions from the audience during the public testimony, and that each person's opinions are respected. We will ask people to leave if they are disruptive during the public hearing. This includes written comments in the chat or any disruptive statements. This is a public hearing that is being recorded as well. Uh, Sam Goodman will now go over the docket and will be keeping time. Sam. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam Goodman. I'm the ULIP coordinator for Bronx Borough President Vanessa Gibson. And I'm just going to read the docket description. Application number N2400010, ZRY, City of Yes, for Economic Opportunity, in the matter of an application submitted by the New York City Department of City Planning, pursuant to section 201 of the New York City Charter, for an amendment of the zoning resolution of the City of New York, modifying multiple sections to support economic growth and resiliency in New York City. If you wish to read the full, uh, the full docket description, it's available at zap.planning.nyc.gov slash projects slash 2023 Y 0405. There's a second application associated with this matter, and that one would be application number N20011 ZRY, City of Yes, for economic opportunity in M districts, manufacturing districts. In the matter of an application submitted by the New York City Department of City Planning, pursuant to section 201 of the New York City Charter for an amendment of the zoning resolution of the City of New York to add new manufacturing or M district options. The full proposed text can be accessed on the zoning application portal and that one would be zap.planning.nyc.gov slash projects slash 202 4 y zero one six one okay thank you very much thank you sam so just to as sam noted this will be for both components of the the text amendment for the city of yes economic opportunity so we will now turn it over to the department of city planning if you could introduce yourselves and then you can begin the presentation thank you Good afternoon, Paul Phillips, our Board Director, Bronx Office Department of City Planning. Good afternoon, Carolyn Grossman Marr, Director of Economic Development and Regional Planning for the Department of City Planning. And Matt Waskevitz, Senior Planner for Economic Development and Regional Planning, Department of City Planning, also Lead Planner for City of Yes for Economic Opportunity. Good afternoon, and thank you for President Gibson for having us. Actually, one second. Are we have the presentation is up? The presentation, the state plan presentation, is that up? It's up? Okay, great, thank you. Just to, we can't see it on the slide. Yeah, just to clarify, we cannot see any of the slides. 
on this screen. While he's getting set up, just wanted to thank you for having us this afternoon and for the opportunity to present and answer any questions you may have or the public may have on these proposals. These proposals for economic growth and resiliency across our city, but especially in the Bronx, have been the result of uh, careful development and, and a process that's lasted over, over two years now, uh, working with organizations like the Bronx Chamber of Commerce, like the Bronx overall EDC, with business improvement districts, with industrial service providers, and with small business owners across the Bronx and across all five boroughs. And so the proposals that we've developed and entered now into the formal public review process are as a result of what we've heard. Um, and so I'll, I'll pause for a second uh, once we have our slides up, but just wanted to thank you for the opportunity. But just to set the stage for what City of Yes is all about. So City of Yes is a series of three separate but related reforms to our city zoning resolution that are designed to meet our city's sustainability crisis, help support small businesses, and create affordable housing as part of Mayor Eric Adams' vision for a more inclusive and equitable City of Yes. So there are three separate zoning proposals as part of the City of Yes umbrella. The first City of Yes for carbon neutrality is currently in the public review process uh, and aims to help our city meet its climate goals by making it easier to green our buildings, our streets, and our city. And City of Yes for housing opportunity is due to enter the formal public review process next spring and is a citywide approach to meeting our city's affordable housing need uh, by making sure that every neighborhood does a little bit more to create affordable housing and in the process create opportunities for housing uh, families here in the Bronx and across our city. And then City of Yes for Housing Opportunity, which is what we're here about today. Uh, sorry, City of Yes for Economic Opportunity, which is what we're here to talk about today is helping to support small businesses across our city and this work coming out of the pandemic uh, in particular to make sure that our zoning is more up to date and more simple and more modern uh, to meet the, the needs of businesses as they seek to locate and grow and expand across our city. So this process, as I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, has really had almost two years now of, of pre-engagement uh, and proposal development. We've had well over 100 meetings with organizations such as business uh, improvement districts, chambers of commerce, and other organizations whose day-to-day -day work is working with small businesses, helping to untangle some of the issues that they might be having. And so we had also five public information sessions, hearing from members of community boards, the general public, trying to get feedback on ways that our zoning might be getting in the way of establishing or expanding business. And so the proposals that we're talking about this, this afternoon, there are 18 of them, and they're a result of this process that we've heard before the beginning of the formal public review. So we are now in the community board and borough president referral stage of the public review process. So over the next month and a half or so, uh, we'll be going out to each of our community boards and, and receiving feedback on, on these proposals. And then uh, later on in the, in the winter, we will have a public hearing and a vote from the City Planning Commission, and then the City Council in the spring will have an opportunity to vote on this package of reforms. So that's a bit on the timeline, as well as the overall sequence of City of Yes. When it comes to businesses and the way that our zoning thinks about business activity in our city, for the most part, we're dealing with regulations that are unchanged since 1961. And the city's economy has evolved quite a bit in, in that time, and, but our zoning hasn't. And so the zoning is full of outdated terms, things like typewriter repair and taxidermy, still define the business types that are being used to figure out where you can locate in an age where cell phone repair is a lot more common than typewriter repair. And as we've been doing this work over the last couple of years, speaking with organizations, understanding ways that zoning might be getting in the way, Oftentimes what we heard is businesses may not know where they can locate because the zoning is 4,000 pages, it's pretty unclear, uh, or they're running into a situation where they sign a lease and then only discover after the fact that they are in a place where they're not supposed to be. And so 
we want to create as a result of this work zoning that is more simple, it's more adaptable, it's more modern, but fundamentally is easier for folks to understand and use. And in doing so, create more access to opportunity and lower the costs to start in. Oh good, we have slides up. Uh, so if you could uh, advance to slide six, please. So as we were developing these proposals, oftentimes what we heard is that the zoning presented a barrier to either a business knowing where they can locate, or once they were able to locate, finding ways in which the zoning was restricting that kind of business activity. So for example, the zoning will restrict a, a, a strict square footage cap on how much space a bakery can have to baking. And so in many cases, these, these barriers were presenting businesses, or presenting barriers to businesses' ability to locate, but also to grow and expand and adapt. And this was particularly crucial for businesses to adapt during the, the pandemic. And so as a result of these changes to our zoning, we want to create zoning that is more simple and is more adaptable and can respond to the changing needs of businesses, but also enable entrepreneurship and business activity across our city's commercial corridors. So we have four main goals for this work. The first, we want to expand options for businesses to find space and grow. The main way we aim to promote propose to do this is through removing restrictions in our zoning for particular business types, thereby making it easier to fill empty space and combating things like storefront vacancy across our city. Our second goal is to boost growing industries. So our city is home to many kinds of emerging industries today, things like urban agriculture and life sciences, experiential business types, and home occupations are expanding as in our city today, but there are ways in which our zoning is holding these business types back, either through ambiguous rules or just restrictions that are more uh, from the 1960s than they are from the 2020s. And so we want to enable and update our regulations for these emerging business types so they can expand across the Bronx and across all five boroughs. Our third goal is to create more vibrant streetscapes and uh, create more safe, actable, active, and walkable streets. Because we know that business activity isn't just about what happens within a building, but also how a business contributes to its surroundings. So these are proposals designed um, to make sure that our streets are also contributing to that economic vibrancy. And fourth and finally, we want to update our zoning toolkit to boost jobs in the future. And so these are ways in which our, our, our zoning tools that we have are, are out of date. They're not giving businesses the pathways they need. And so we want to, as we're thinking about all of this work, uh, to update that zoning toolkit as well. So we have 18 specific proposals within City of Yes for economic opportunity. I will walk through each of those and want to confirm whether we can move to slide, I believe it is nine. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay. So goal one, these first six proposals are aimed at modernizing our city's zoning regulations to make it easier for businesses to find space and grow, particularly across commercial corridors and empty storefront space. Proposal number one, in many of the city's residential areas, you have storefronts. These may be corner stores or these may be stores that have um, been there for generations, for decades, but our, our current zoning, which was adopted in 1961, may have um, made it so that you can't reactivate some of these storefront spaces because the areas are zoned for residences only. And what this means is that in some parts of our city, if a storefront space is vacant for more than two years, it is not possible in our zoning to reactivate that form of storefront space and so it would have to remain vacant. So in these places where there is a storefront already, we want to allow for that space to become reactivated. We think this is a clear way in which our zoning is getting in the way of being able to fill vacant space. Proposal two, we have many kinds of commercial zoning designations or districts today. Um, and many of these are located in similar places despite having different rules. So for example, there are many streets of the Bronx where you can walk down that commercial street on one side of the street is one kind of zoning district. On the other side of the street is another kind of zoning district. And the rules are different for what kinds of businesses can be on either side of the street. And it can make it very confusing for businesses to know where they can locate. 
And it also just does not make sense for the way that our, our commercial corridors have adapted over the last six decades. And so we want to simplify these district types, allow for the same mix of businesses in neighborhood commercial C1 and C2 uh, districts, and allow for the same mix of businesses across our more centrally located or higher density commercial areas. These are our C4, C5, and C6 commercial districts. Proposal three. Our zoning today allows for limited kinds of manufacturing, things like bakeries, but also things like apparel making to occur in neighborhood commercial settings. But for the most part, manufacturing activities are limited to our city's M districts or industrial areas. And yet there are many kinds of clean production and, and maker space and maker retail, things like food and beverage making, things like coffee roasting and uh, 3D printing and jewelry making and the like that are not only appropriate to locate in neighborhood commercial contexts, but in fact can enhance these commercial corridors by allowing a greater mix of, of business types, but also allowing for spaces for entrepreneurship and growth of Bronx made businesses. And so we think it's important that these businesses be able to locate at a small scale in commercial areas, but make sure that they have environmental standards so that they're not creating a nuisance for, for their neighbors. Proposal four. So if you are one of these maker businesses I just mentioned, and you want to locate in a space above the ground floor, let's say you're a, a 3D printer that wants to occupy some empty office space, you might be allowed to do so because proposal three, but proposal, but our loading rules might prohibit you from being able to occupy that space. So we want to, when you have an existing building, not have additional loading docks when you want to change the mix of business types within that building. We think it's a really important and necessary thing to make it easier to fill empty space. Proposal five is about places where our zoning does allow for a mix of both residential and non-residential um, activities within most buildings, but in certain circumstances, it limits the partial conversion of say an office building to having part of that building be with residences. It's a part of our zoning called stacking rules, and it's, it uh, can make it hard to do this. And so where it makes sense, we want to allow for commercial and residential uses on the same level or above, um, have commercial uses located above residences, provided that we have a number of safeguards in place, like making sure that there are separate entrances and uh, separate elevators if, if the building needs that. Uh, between these uses and making sure that any any commercial businesses seeking to locate close to residences have uh, strict noise standards that they have to meet in order to not become a nuisance. Lastly, under this first goal, the terms we have for defining and classifying business types in our zoning are particularly out of date. This is where things like typewriter repair are still on the books, but cell phone repair is not. And so we want to both simplify but also modernize the way in which we define and classify our business types to reflect today's economy, make it much more clear on where you can locate and what you can do. Next slide, please. Goal two, we want to support and boost growing industries. These are five specific industries that are growing in our city today where we have identified zoning barriers or confusion that we want to alleviate, make it more clear where these businesses can locate so they can grow, create jobs across the Bronx and across our city. First on urban agriculture. You can have a greenhouse in any commercial area. So you can have a greenhouse on a roof above a storefront. You can have one in open space in a commercial area. But there is some confusion in our zoning as to whether you can grow in a building like you would in a greenhouse in a commercial area. So we want to clarify that and say urban agriculture, so vertical farming, hydroponics, uh, and being able to grow food closer to communities is really important, and we want to enable that here. Proposal eight, life sciences. It's a growing industry across our city today, but especially so in the Bronx, and we want to do everything we can to make it clear on where a, a safe, regulated commercial laboratory is allowed to locate. So what we're doing here is we're updating the terminology we have for labs, make it clear that these, these, these kinds of businesses are allowed so long as they're not having any kind of environmental concerns. Uh, and we also want to update where an existing special permit is allowed so we can have research happening closer to hospitals and universities. Uh, Proposal nine on nightlife. So today in our zoning, in any bar or restaurant in the city, you can have a live band. 
and you can have music with, ticketed, with tickets up to a 200 person capacity. But our zoning still prohibits dancing in many of those same places to the music that you can already listen to. And it also prohibits things like live comedy and open mic nights and other forms of live entertainment in the same spaces where, again, you can already have live musical entertainment. So what we want to do here is remove those last remnants of the city's cabaret laws and make it clear that if you can have live music in a space that's small, you can also dance to the music in that space. Proposal 10. The way that our zoning thinks about experiential business types, these are things like virtual reality, children's arcades, escape rooms, laser tag, and the like. It's really out of date. This is a, a mantra you'll hear me keep on coming back to, but it defines terms like tennis courts, but it doesn't define all these new kinds of experiential businesses that you see growing. And as a result, these businesses typically are only allowed to locate in industrial areas or in Coney Island. Now, you go north to Westchester, you'll see all kinds of fun family-friendly activities that are allowed just across the Westchester border. There is no reason that those businesses shouldn't be able to locate in the Bronx as well. We think they're appropriate at a small scale along neighborhood commercial corridors, and we think they're appropriate at a larger scale in a more higher density or centrally located location. Lastly, under home occupations, our zoning today allows for a wide range of home businesses. For example, you could be a lawyer, you could be a music teacher, you could be a jeweler, a, um, a music teacher or a lawyer. Uh, you can have clients visit you in your home. You could not be a barber though. You couldn't be an interior designer. And we saw a lot during the pandemic um, that our rules for, for home-based businesses just aren't keeping up with the way that remote work is continuing and the way that this kind of activity for entrepreneurship is continuing in our city. And so we want to update our regulations for home-based businesses, but keep in place a lot of the safeguards that we have today around being good neighbors. So not having things like exterior signage, not creating any noises or odors or dust that might impact your neighbors. Next slide, please. Goal three, these are ways in which we want to, to make sure that our businesses contribute to safe and walkable and uh, vibrant streets. And we recognize that the way that our businesses operate, that it's not just about the activity happening within the building, but it's also about how that business contributes to the rest of the, the businesses and the residences around it. So these three proposals are designed to address some ways in which our, our zoning is, um, needs to be able to better make sure that contribution occurs. First, on better floor ground, better ground floor designs, our zoning regulations today for what we call streetscapes, so these are the things like uh, maybe a long blank wall, uh, a long brick wall, or something like uh, transparency for windows. In many parts of our city, there are no rules whatsoever. So you could see a, you could be walking along a commercial street, you have retail storefronts, and then suddenly you have a long brick wall. And that creates a, a deadening effect and can make it harder for economic vibrancy for all of the businesses along that corridor. So we want to make sure that when we have new construction or alterations of businesses that they're contributing to their surroundings, creating more consistent and easier to understand ground floor design. Proposal 13. Auto repair businesses are mostly considered industrial. They're allowed to locate in our city's industrial areas, but there are limited kinds of vehicle repair that are allowed along commercial streets. And what we find is that sometimes these businesses, their business activity spills out into the sidewalk or into the, the street itself. And this can create conflicts with other vehicles as well as people who are walking past. And so what we're doing here is we want to make sure that if you have an auto repair business that's new, seeking to locate in a commercial neighborhood retail street, uh, that they go through a site plan review with the Board of Standards and Appeals just to make sure that that activity is contained within the lot and isn't going to be spilling out into neighboring, neighboring lots. Lastly, proposal 14, micro distribution. So we're zoning today, it allows for a thing like a post office. You can have neighborhood based hubs for deliveries, for package drop off and pickup. But if you're not the federal government, you can't do that same sort of activity in our zoning today. And what that results in is a lot of what you see in this photo here, where you have a delivery van that's parked on a sidewalk or double parked on a street, simply because there is no place within a storefront space for that kind of activity to occur. So what we're doing here is creating at a small scale, the ability for 
delivery neighbor, neighborhood based hubs. We think this is a really important proposal for alleviating some truck congestion that's happening from deliveries, as well as shifts to alternative modes of delivering those, those packages. Next slide, please. So our fourth and our final goal, <clears throat> excuse me, is about creating new opportunities for businesses to open through expanding and updating our zoning toolkit for when businesses need pathways that uh, allow them to modify the zoning. So our zoning today, you have as of right zoning, where if the zoning says you can do that activity, you can do it so long as you go through the necessary permitting process with other agencies. But if you want to tweak what the zoning says you can do, you have to go through a discretionary process where you go before the community board, where you go before the borough president's office, where you go before the city council to modify your existing zoning. So these four proposals are new kinds of discretionary zoning tools that update and modernize our city's zoning toolkit. Proposal 15 on campus commercial. Most large scale residential campuses, such as NYCHA campuses, their zone is residential, and this means they don't have the ability to locate retail services or maker space um, on their campuses. This can place residents further from local goods and services, and a lot of what we hear is the, the need to be able to make it easier to be able to do this kind of activity. So this is a pathway that would allow a large scale residential campus to have limited space for commercial on, on that campus. Proposal 16. If you're in one of the city's residential districts today, you have corner stores and other forms of retail businesses that predate our 1961 zoning, but you can't create new space. There's no pathway available to you even to modify or change the business type of an existing store in some cases. So what we want to do here is create a limited pathway that would allow for small scale corner stores to be able to locate in a residential area, provided they go through a process that includes environmental review and community board review as well as the borough presence. Proposal 17. Sometimes there are limited zoning uh, rules, things like the shape of the building or the location of the building within its zoning a lot that make it hard to build new kinds of buildings like film studios. And so we want to expand our discretionary zoning toolkit to enable for businesses that want to change the shape of their zoning to do so uh, through a process. And last but not least, sometimes it's our zoning districts themselves and not the ways to modify them that are out of date. This is especially true with our city's M districts or manufacturing districts. And so we want to create a suite of new kinds of zoning tools for the future to enable for uh, loft-like buildings and other kinds of industrial um, buildings to be built in our city's industrial areas. Uh, next slide, please. I touched on this when I didn't have slides, but I'll, I'll briefly mention again where we are in the process. We're in the middle of the referral period. So this is the part of the public review where we go out to each of the city's 59 community boards and present these proposals, receive your feedback and requests for any changes. Uh, we will have a public hearing at the city planning commission for this suite of proposals sometime early next year, followed by a vote from the city planning commission and then this package of reforms to our zoning goes to the city council for a vote sometime in the spring. Next slide, please. So I went through a lot of information at a pretty high level, but we have a lot more detail on our website, nyc.gov slash yes, economic opportunity. We have a number of different resources to help you in understanding these proposals to give you a lot more detail on them. Uh, we have snapshots of jobs and storefront vacancy for each of the city's 59 community districts. We have much more detail about each of the 18 proposals I went through today. We have, uh, for those who are more technically inclined and want to see the actual zoning text, we have the zoning text on our website along with some plain language comments explaining each of the changes we're making and to help you understand the complex and technical language. And then last but not least, we've translated each current business type to where it would be in the future in this proposal and back. So now you will know if you happen to be a taxidermy uh, and you're still, still thriving and you wanna know where you fall under this new zoning, don't fear, you will still know where you can locate um, and we have an easy tool for you to do that. So with that, I will pause for any questions that you folks might have, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. That was extensive. And for those that are here in person and for those that are remote, I hope that everyone gets a great understanding of what the City of Yes, the Economic Opportunities Proposal is all about. I'm looking at the four goals and 18 different uh, ideas, uh, making it easy to find space and grow within our city, knowing that we are a city that is growing in population, supporting emerging industries, which we know will bring more jobs, uh, stimulate the economy, making sure that we cater to new industries, many of which have not always embraced diversity. So I think about young students, college students, opportunities in the tech, the life sciences industry, research, film, gaming, uh, where you have not always seen uh, young people and young people of color. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Fostering vibrant neighborhoods and want to be very respectful that this is a city that is growing, but we have a lot of predominantly residential communities. We have commercial corridors, we have commercial thoroughfares, we have business improvement districts. We have a lot in this city. And I think the, the best approach with this idea and this proposal is to make sure that when we talk about vibrant neighborhoods, what does that look like um, from the perspective of being a tenant, a resident, an owner, uh, a renter, uh, an homeowner, you know, someone that resides in our communities that are raising their families and looking at new opportunities. Um, opportunities for businesses is something that we are very supportive of with our economic development work and making sure that we support uh, the organizations that you talked about, the Bronx Chamber of Commerce, Lisa Sarin and her team, all of our business improvement districts, the newest one being Castle Hill, uh, where we have formalized organizations that are creating the access within their communities. Um, so I guess, generally speaking, before I get into my series of questions, um, as we are in the public review process and we're working with all 59 community boards, the 12 that we represent in the Bronx, this is really an opportunity for all of our community board members, all 600 that we appoint to 12 community boards, our district managers, our board chairs, executive committees, and all of our chairs of the economic development, land use, housing and land use committees to make sure that they're a part of these conversations. What I don't want to happen is the public review process, which is on a time frame, right? Time is ticking. I don't want this to bypass our community boards without any input because ultimately this is something that is going to be done across the city of New York and the Bronx has a role to play. And we want to make sure that everything we do is about engagement, it is community driven, and it really keeps in mind the residents that live and work in our borough. Um, often has been the case, the Bronx has been left behind, shortchanged and ignored. But under this administration, we have a mayor that is a five borough mayor that recognizes that the Bronx is a big part of the revitalization of our city. So for that, we are grateful. So this opportunity that we have before us is really a chance to talk, to dialogue, to come up with the best ideas. As it has been said, we have not seen this level of zoning changes since 1961. I was not born in 1961, and many of us may not have been born, and those that were here remember 1961 and what zoning looked like. So this is something that has not been done for decades. So this is a chance to do better, to get it right, and looking at how we can create shared neighborhoods. It's the same conversation that we often have around our streetscape when it comes to transportation infrastructure. Whether you ride a bike, whether you walk, you're a pedestrian, you take the bus, you take accessory ride, you drive, you're a bus driver, everyone has to share our streets. And sometimes we feel that this is a system that's been unequal for so many years where the drivers have ownership of our streets. So we are changing the conversation and the atmosphere in which we're doing work. Um, so I'm excited about this possibility. Generally speaking, I see a lot of this that I can support within all 18. <laughs> uh, I see a lot of great things, uh, but certainly I do have some concerns. So I wanna get to proposal number five. 
that enables commercial activity on upper floors. So just in that regard, I can see some concerns. If you live in a three or four story building uh, and potentially looking at commercial activity on an upper floor, I want to understand from DCP, what are we doing to make sure that we address any concerns that residents may have around noise, around foot traffic, tenants versus customers that are coming to this particular location. Um, if this is approved, how do we delineate and make sure that there, as you mentioned, a separation of entrance and exit signage, but making sure that both populations do not intertwine, but then also regulations around noise. Uh, we have a lot of noise in New York City, and I think the Bronx is one of the boroughs that has the highest number of noise complaints that go into 311. So this is something that I think warrants further conversation, but I would love to understand allowing commercial districts to include uh, residential where it's not permitted, uh, but also the commercial on upper floors. How would we find that balance and that level of sensitivity for the commercial owner as well as the residential component? Thank you, Borough President. Thank you for the, the question. Um, I think you said the key word there, which is balance. So for, for proposal five, where in our zoning today, you can have many buildings in our city where you have a mix of commercial and residential. In fact, the most common building typology along our commercial streets is you have a storefront and you have some residences or apartments or houses above. And what we know is that in many of our city's higher density areas, you have, in some cases, larger office buildings that are, some of them, may want to convert uh, to, to other uses. And so that might be another kind of commercial use, that might be one of these clean production uses, and that may be residents. And there are a number of ways in which our city's regulations for office to residential conversion are really difficult and, and tough to navigate if you own an office building today. So we're addressing a lot of that in our city for housing opportunity proposal. But one thing we're doing to, in this proposal is enabling that partial conversion by getting something called stacking rules out of the way. So they allow for you to have a residence and a commercial on the same level and the potential to have a commercial unit above a residence. And the main ways in which we're allowing that, um, they have to have complete separation. So I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier and I'll get more into detail on it, where if you're in the example you gave a three or four story walk-up building, it would be very difficult for you to even meet that requirement alone to be able to allow for this mix because you would have to have a separate entrance, you'd have to clearly show on a plan that you intend to do that. And furthermore, um, in our city's housing crisis, we think it's very, very unlikely you see existing housing convert to non-residential uses. The demand for housing is just so high in our city that we don't think that that would be a very common scenario even in an instance where the building already was set up to allow. So that's the separation. You have complete separation in separate entrances, separate lobbies. If the building is tall enough, you need separate elevator banks, which is why we think this proposal is most useful in places where it's a large office building and they need to convert, say, one elevator bank of that office building to another use. And they can do that because the building is already fit out for that purpose. Okay. So that's the separation. Um, and then on, on noise, this is also something that we built into our zoning recognizing that um, it is much easier, in a sense, to require the zoning to say, you cannot have a noisy use than to have a situation in which the noisy use moves in and then you have complaints to 311. So we wanted to make sure in this proposal where we are potentially allowing uh, a mix of commercial and residential uses in places where they're not today, that any use that has the potential to generate noise is before it's even allowed to move in, doing things that can be clearly proved on a site plan that would prevent them from having that. So what I mean to say is they have to either separate by at least 15 feet, that 15 feet must include two clear separation walls that are built into the building plan, or that use must have a sound engineer certify that the structure has met 
a sound standard that will make it so that any noise generated from that use is the same as the ambient sound around it. So they either have to separate or they have to attenuate, and all of that has to occur prior to DOB issuing that certificate of occupancy, prior to that business being allowed to move in. And so those are ways in which the zoning, admittedly these are pretty stringent requirements, but we think they're necessary ones because we take very seriously places where we want to make sure we have that balance of quality of life, but allowing for business activity. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the recognition that there are many communities across our borough that have predominantly been residential that honestly need to remain residential. Uh, residents care about their communities. The character of our neighborhoods must be preserved. We have a lot of historic landmarks and, and different designations, most recently in Longwood, historic district on Manida Street. So I know that residents, homeowners care about that protection. Uh, we want to be team players. We want to look at new uses and certainly mixed use opportunities in many of our new construction. But for the most part, um, I don't think that this proposal will necessarily uh, be felt across our borough, um, just in terms of what you're describing. Um, and, and that's okay, I'm okay with that. Uh, everything will not apply to the Bronx, but obviously this is a proposal for the city of New York. So I wanna make sure that you know we are bringing up some of the issues that I know will come up and have already come up at many of our community boards. So another question that I do have when it comes to the work of DCP is the interagency coordination. I've said this many times when I was a former member of the city council because a lot of housing projects that came to our office had a commercial overlay on the ground level, usually for the purposes of healthcare center facilities, FQHCs, early childcare, UPK, 3K, sometimes retail when it comes to supermarkets, which we know we need but I also struggle sometimes with the interagency connections. So if HPD is proposing housing and we have the New York City Public Schools, DYCD on youth facilities, how are we making sure that with the proposal before us, DCP is working on enforcing existing regulations when it comes to FDNY, when it comes to BSA, when it comes to DOB, HPD and any other agency that oversees our existing infrastructure. That is so important because most New Yorkers do not know who to blame when there is a problem. Uh, and so if we tighten that up and streamline it a little bit more, we have to make sure that the agencies are working together and having the same conversation. I completely agree. It's really, really important because zoning is only one small piece of this Correct. puzzle. Yes. And when you're thinking about small businesses and all the many tangled webs of city and state and sometimes federal regulations they have to navigate, it makes business doing really hard, but it's also really crucial that when we change our zoning, we want to make sure that we're not, we're not breaking anything and that we are making sure that we're building into the zoning ways to make that zoning not only more easy for businesses to understand, but easier for other agencies to both interpret and enforce. And so we've had a whole of government, city government approach to this work from the get-go, where we've worked with a wide range of the alphabet soup of different agencies, ranging from uh, BSA and DOB and FDNY, but also including small business services, yeah. also including the EDC, also including Department of Environmental Protection, and all the different ways in which our, our city zoning ends and another city, another agency's regulatory jurisdiction begins. And we wanna make sure that in between there's no gap in the way that we've been working. So one quick example is the, uh, the upper floor commercial that I was just talking about, where we wanted to make sure, and we worked very closely hand in hand with both DOB and Department of Environmental Protection on, on that, crafting that proposal, making sure we get it right so that when you are uh, including businesses where they might not be allowed today in proximity to residences, you're doing that with very conscious recognition of what the noise code can and cannot regulate, what the building code can and cannot regulate, and making sure that zoning is ensuring that there are no noisy impacts, for example, when it comes to those kinds of things. So these, we've been working extremely closely with DOB in particular on this proposal, as we do with, with everything that we do, but uh, 
Uh, it's been really whole of government from the get-go on this. Okay. Well, with DCP leading the conversation with our various agencies, you know, I want to make sure that we emphasize the importance of working together because every agency has its own priorities, responsibilities, staffing, regulations, guidelines. And if we're not working together, that just creates chaos. And sometimes on the ground, the residents who live and work in these communities see much more than we do because if we don't come out for a 311 call for an emergency or a general inspection, the city agencies are just not there. Uh, and so it's critically important, certainly in light of the fiscal climate in which the city is now existing under, you know, pegs and, and what's happening with the November plan, the January plan as we get ready for FY25. Uh, I am greatly concerned about just oversight and making sure that there is a sufficient enforcement. Um, so my hope is, is as we move this process forward, um, our mayor will understand that the City of Yes proposal means that we cannot look at budget cuts. We cannot reduce headcount. We cannot reduce resources for these agencies when it comes to maximizing opportunities that ultimately, if you think about this proposal, it should be thought about from the perspective of generating revenue. Generating revenue for the city, for the Bronx, but also the jobs that will come out of that. Connecting residents with job and career pathways. So it will ultimately benefit us, but we have to do the work and plant the seeds and put in the resources at the onset so that this proposal can go through successfully. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Does. Okay, okay, great. Uh, I had a question on proposal three that focuses on expanding opportunities for small scale clean production. I wanted to know if you could expand a little bit on what you mean by clean production and how that relates to the Bronx and the city of New York from an, a health equity perspective. And I bring that up, many of you all know, number 62 out of all 62 counties in the state of New York, some of the highest rates of asthma, heart disease, obesity, diabetes that we live with today, we've made success in many areas, but we still struggle. When we talk about proposals like capping the Cross Bronx, creating a platform over the Cross Bronx Expressway to deal with environmental injustice and systemic racism, making sure that families are breathing clean air, renewable energy, right? Everything that we've talked about uh, with carbon neutrality. So I want to understand what clean production means because I don't want to do anything that's going to make it worse when it comes to our health outcomes. Absolutely. So clean is, is, has a lot more uh, technical language behind it, okay. but is the result of uh, quite a bit of interagency dialogue and discussion to make sure that we're not doing anything that would create a negative health outcome for, for any nearby resident. So the kinds of businesses that would be allowed under this proposal are, are ones where um, they're already allowed in buildings that you have both residences and in uh, have light industrial uses. So these are our MX districts where you can allow both light industrial and residential already. This has been the city's policy since the 90s, and we're expanding that same framework to our city's commercial districts where you have that same proximity. So these are businesses that must meet uh, state environmental standards for air quality, uh, and they have to certify to that a, they are not going to do anything that would create or, or release emissions that would be above state, state uh, regulatory thresholds. And separately, they cannot do anything that would require a right to know filing with the city for potentially hazardous substances. Mm -hmm. So those are two existing safeguards we have in our zoning today that we're extending. But in addition to that, we're requiring that if the city or the state or the federal government requires you to vent your, your business, that you must vent that business above the height, not only of the building you're in, but above the height of any adjacent building. So for instance, if you're a bakery, and you're one story, and you want to start expanding what you do, and want to do some more wholesale, you would have to ensure that that, that business uh, meets the state's regulations for, uh, I believe it's state ag and markets, 
uh, for regulating food processing and manufacture businesses, and so you would have to meet their venting standards and you would have to meet what the zoning says around venting. So this just furthers to ensure that you are not releasing anything into the atmosphere that others could breathe in and that could be potentially harmful. Okay, is there a way that we can incorporate some sort of a, I don't like to always use the word mandate, so let me say highly suggest, uh, renewable and clean energy. And we look at opportunities where we can look at energy efficiency, building sustainability. Can that be incorporated in this portion? Sure. I, I can take that. Thank you, okay. uh, Madam Borough President. It's a great idea. Um, we just, as I believe you know, uh, completed work in the City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality Text Amendment mm -hmm. that did a lot to encourage um, new kinds of green uses like solar uh, panels in buildings, battery storage, um, electrical vehicle charging. So we have a whole new set of zoning tools that are helping us to incorporate those kinds of uses also that were previously um, <clears throat> not possible under zoning, but um, should the city council pass the, <clears throat> pardon me, um, should the, the, the city council pass the zoning tax, those will be uh, available tools for all of these businesses. And above and beyond zoning, there's a lot that the city can and is doing to try and promote businesses incorporating those new kinds of green technologies through, for instance, the IDA tax incentive program and other small business uh, service uh, supports. There's a lot we're doing, um, and we'd be happy, of course, to pass resources onto your office um, and help um, promote our sister agencies that are doing a lot of direct work to um, make those kinds of investments um, uh, um, feasible um, as we are through zoning, making them possible. Okay, great. Uh, let me go to the second bucket around <laughs> growing industries. I wanted to ask about, so life sciences, I'm all in for life sciences. We've been doing great work with Montefiore Einstein and others talking about what life sciences means from the perspectives of jobs and career opportunities. So that's something that I think would be very popular as we continue to build that out. Um, a lot of this work is about education. It's about embracing change uh, and, and really making sure that people that are not used to certain industries can look at it from a positive perspective. So we have the legalization of cannabis that we have been dealing with for two years and we have the eruption of many of our uh, cannabis licensees, but we also have the unlicensed operators, right? And so that's an industry that we are embracing from an equity and justice perspective, but we know that there's a population that doesn't embrace it. So I say the same thing around life sciences. Nightlife is also an industry. I remember when we uh, made changes to the cabaret law because uh, I didn't realize at first that we could not dance in some of our establishments. Um, but specifically, I wanted to ask about the home-based businesses. Does this apply and would it apply to apartment buildings, multifamily dwelling units, or would this be more home ownership based? The reason I ask that is because when you create the arena that we're promoting home-based businesses, we know that there will always be bad actors that will take advantage of a new provision of a new law and use it for something negative. So most recently in the past couple of weeks, we've had major takedowns of drugs and drug trafficking happening in places that it shouldn't happen, in daycare centers and pizzerias and apartment buildings, right? And so those actions not just affect that unit, but it affects the whole building. And so as we build this out and, and look at the entrepreneurial opportunities, which I understand, many people are now working at home. We learn remotely. We don't have to go into office settings. You have a lot of businesses that start out in their homes and they have incubator space and they grow out and become that bakery. Um, but I want to make sure how can we streamline that to make sure that the rules are tight, that it doesn't allow for those types of practices that we know are not good. If you understand what I'm trying to say. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's helpful to talk about home businesses first in okay. what the zoning allows today. So okay. if you're in a, if you're in a building generally, and if you're a tenant in a building, you can have a lease agreement that supersedes the local zoning. So it's just like how if I sign a lease and my lease says I can't have a dog, you can have a lease that says I can't have a home business or a certain type of home business. So that's allowed today, but generally speaking, 
if you're in a rental unit, if you're in your own home and you own it, you can have a home-based business, but the key to that is you have to be a home first. So in the zoning term, it's considered accessory or secondary to the dwelling unit. And a couple of key things in there, you have to be living in the dwelling unit. So it can't just be an empty space. Um, it is limited either to a certain cap of square footage or to a percentage of the house. And you also have rules around, you can't have displays of items. So you can't turn something into a retail storefront essentially. So you can't have displays, you can't sell anything you didn't make on site, but perhaps most importantly, you cannot do anything that would create odor, noise, dust, um, particulate matter, or what the zoning calls other objectionable effects, AKA nuisances. And so that is the way the zoning is structured today. And if you are doing one of these things and you're in a home that you own, or if you're in a rental, um, the enforcement has kind of two different pathways. If you're in your own home and your, your neighbors complain, typically it is the Department of Buildings that responds to that. Um, and depending on the nature of the complaint, other agencies can and would get involved. And typically those complaints are made through 311. If you are in a rental unit, you additionally would have the building management likely get involved, especially if there is something in the lease that might be in conflict with the nature of the complaint. And so in those instances, in all instances, the Department of Buildings can issue fines, they can shut down the business, but if you're in a rental, additionally, you could uh, have be violating the terms of your lease and all of what could result in violating those terms of your lease. So that's what the zoning allows today, citywide. What we're proposing is a few tweaks here. So there are certain business types like barbers, like stockbrokers, like uh, interior designers that are not allowed. They're explicitly not allowed in the home. We want to allow them, provided they meet those same regulations that I just mentioned. We also want to expand the, the cap on the size, the percentage of your dwelling unit that can be devoted to business activity from 25 to 49%, particularly important for things like a one bedroom apartment where 25% is very quite small. Um, as well as 500 square feet, where if you own your own home, you might have a room that's above 500 square feet. And so uh, it is on both ends of the, that spectrum trying to liberalize those rules a little bit more. And then the last thing, which I think is important to note, is the zoning today allows you up to one employee associated with your home-based business. We would expand that to three employees for two main reasons. The first is there are many kinds of startups that might have people associated with their home business. We think it's important to be able to allow for that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial activity for that registration, but also say you're a contractor like a plumber or an electrician, same reason, be able to register folks to your home business. Um, and so having that, that slight allowance uh, allows for more of that entrepreneurship to occur. So that's the full home-based business, both enforcement, what zoning allows and what we're proposing. Okay, so in addition to the agencies, are we actively having conversations with owners, with landlords? Because at the end of the day, they have to enforce these rules in addition to the city agencies. Yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. Um, I have two more questions and I'll wrap it up because I know that we have people online and in person. But when you talk about fostering vibrant neighborhoods, as I mentioned, there's a lot of activity, mixed use all over our city, all over the borough and the challenge is finding a balance so that there's a shared responsibility for streets, for activating spaces. Uh, number 13 sticks out to me because when I was in the council, I represented Jerome Avenue and all of the auto repair shops along the Jerome Avenue corridor in community boards four and five. And you talk about the spillover, the activity on sidewalks and streets, that's absolutely apparent today. Uh, and that's something that we've always strived to work with and change. Uh, auto repair shops are important to our borough, to our economy. Many of them are immigrant businesses. They are not owners, they are renters. They don't speak English as a primary language. So there is a lot. Uh, what I've talked about over the years uh, of being in the council and I was bar president is to make sure that our auto repair industry is ready for the next generation. So the electric vehicles, the training that comes with that from SBS, how can we get them to be prepared so that they are still viable? But they are also neighbors of ours. They are 
community partners, they are a part of the fabric of our community. But we also need everyone to behave better. The activity, the derelict vehicles that I see on the streets is not acceptable today. So when you talk about reducing the conflicts, I wonder what that looks like because it's working with the auto repair industry, their leaders, spokespersons, but also you have a lot of these uh, in these repair shops that are not necessarily on a Jerome Avenue, uh, on a White Plains Road, they're not on a, a major commercial corridor. Some of them are situated in areas that are a little bit more residential, right? And you have that. Um, so I wonder what your thoughts are around figuring out how do we streamline this and reduce the conflict? Because at the end of the day, we're not pushing them out, but we do want to make sure that they're a good neighbor as everyone else should be. Yeah, that's absolutely right, and I think I'll 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 start, and then I'll I'll defer to some of my colleagues uh, who work more locally. So, when it comes to auto repair businesses, you're absolutely right; they're critical parts of our economy. Many of these are immigrant businesses, and many New Yorkers and Bronxites own cars and need them serviced. Yeah, uh, and so we recognize they're an important part of the economic fabric, but. There are two, what we're doing in the zoning is making distinctions on two types of auto repair. There's heavy auto repair. So heavy auto repair, as the name implies, are things like you're, you're repairing your engine. You have a licensure from the state Department of Motor Vehicles saying that that's the kind of work you do. And we're saying if you're in an industrial area, that is a good activity for you to be doing in an industrial area. But if you're in a more residential area, then maybe you shouldn't be doing auto body repair uh, and having that activity spill out into the sidewalk. So what we're suggesting for the zoning is that if you're doing auto repair and it's in a residential context or even a neighborhood commercial street, so not industrial, that you have to go through site plan review if you're a new business that's seeking to locate or if you're going to do something that's significantly changing your business. So it's, it is our, our goal, our intent with this initiative is is to make sure that as businesses adapt and change and, and seek to locate perhaps new update with electric vehicle repair and things like that, that that activity is happening where it is not conflicting with neighbors, not leading to safety concerns or environmental concerns as well. So by having that site plan review process through the BSA, it helps ensure some of those safeguards. Now, there are other things that other agencies can do that are complementary, of course, but this is the way that zoning can help address some of these, these issues. And I'm not sure, if, Paul, if there's anything you would add. No, I mean, I think, I, I think um, Madam President, you bring up a good point about, and obviously Jerome was a study that we worked on and we had to take the auto related uses into account. I do think that the, the BSA process is gonna be helpful for new businesses and having some oversight in terms of what types of businesses locate in these neighborhoods that are really more commercial, but also allowing like you know business development to, to happen and grow. So I think there there is, there is a balance, and I think the proposal um, speaks to that. Okay, um, I don't think I've ever witnessed BSA having a community uh, outreach on the ground. Uh, like when, when we work with SBS, we walk the streets, we walk the businesses, Department of Consumer Affairs, Worker Protection. I mean, we literally made sure that businesses knew who we were. So maybe this is an opportunity for BSA to have that community orientation and that community engagement because I guarantee you if you go to one business, they don't know who BSA is today. They don't know what it stands for, they don't know who they are, and they don't know what they do. Right, and we don't want the first introduction to be a bad one where it's because of an infraction or some sort of a violation, but rather we want it to be more of an orientation uh, and an introduction to what the agency does uh, and is looking to do to engage with new businesses, but I know also existing as well. Okay, um, my final question, and, and this is something that's gonna be very popular, is number 16 under new opportunities for businesses creating a process for allowing corner stores in residential areas. So I think of corner stores, I think of grocery stores. I'm certain that bodegas fit in that category as well. We have a lot of grocery stores, a lot of delis, a lot of bodegas in the Bronx, in residential communities, on corners, everywhere. And I, I wonder what that looks like. I can imagine that many Bronxites would question uh, how many we're looking to add on and the existing uh, grocery stores and corner stores that we have today. Uh, some are 24 hours, some are late night, 
Uh, I've seen a variety of things. Um, they're heavily used. They were open during the pandemic, so I'm not trying to take away the value of what corner stores bring, but I think that it has to be done with a recognition of balance and not one of saturation and not oversaturating areas that already have a lot of corner stores. Uh, and so is that something as we look to create this process out in this plan, will there be a limit? Will there be square footage guidelines? I mean, anything that you could share with us to make us feel that this is something that will add more value and not saturate communities, but also look at balance within residential neighborhoods. Thank you, Borough President, for the, for the question. And as you point out, the Bronx already has many, many corner stores that exist in our city's residential areas and, and in places that are not zoned for them. And in, in the vast majority of cases, they're really crucial parts of the neighborhood fabric. They give people access to local goods and services. They provide access to something where you can walk to pick up something rather than having to drive a few blocks to do that. And they also create that sort of neighborhood fabric that makes New York what it is in all, in all parts of our, our city. But what this proposal does is recognizes that there is no pathway to create a new corner store, even if you wanted one in one of these areas. And this proposal in and of itself does not create a single corner store. It creates a process for the community to consider whether they would allow one. And it, it's, it is discretionary, so it would have to go through the community board. It would also have to go through the borough president's office. And that building owner or potential business would have to also do an environmental assessment to make sure that they're not creating traffic or other kinds of environmental concerns. And because there is so much community opportunity for input engagement and recommendations around it, uh, it is not the case that it would be as of right. So you are not allowing corner stores to occur just at the snap of a finger. But it also creates an important pathway for an existing corner store to say, modify or change their business or to slightly adapt what they're doing. Because again, because they're not allowed under zoning, they're considered non-conforming. It really is like a straitjacket where they can't do many things that they may wish to. So it's an important path, but it is not guaranteed. It is not absolute. We think it is on a case-by-case -case basis and one that involves lots of community input from the start to beginning or from the start to the end if they want to be successful in having that application go forward. Okay, great, thank you. Actually, Matt, if you can clarify one thing. Yeah. Um, you said during the discretionary process that it would go to the committee boards, but then it would also go to the borough president. If this is an authorization, is that built into it? I, I think that is a, mis, a, a misstated uh, technical uh, reflection of the authorization. Right. However, as an informal matter, we would, of course, expect the borough president's office to be able Thank to. Thank you. Just yeah. verifying yeah. The, the exact. Yeah, I appreciate your clarifying. All right, thank you. Uh, I know I had a lot of questions, but I think it's detail is very important for me. And I want to make sure that in areas where we can encourage creative ways to add more commercial to residential areas, we should consider it. But I think this is all about balance. We have many neighborhoods across the Bronx that have done their fair share when it comes to commercial activity and they continue to do more. But we have a lot of neighborhoods that can consider. And I want Bronx sites that are here, that are listening, to realize that this is all about providing access, stimulating the economy, looking at local jobs, making sure that we are lifting up families. And if we can do that from an innovative way, then that's something that I want everyone to consider. Understand that this is not us shoving a plan down anyone's throat. We're not doing that, but we're having these conversations now because we want an opportunity for all of our stakeholders to weigh in. Ultimately, we wish we could get to every resident of our borough, but we know that's not always possible. And that's why we rely on our 12 community boards to really carry the message and be the advocates, be you know the ones that are critical, but also provide the input that is necessary to make this proposal even better. It started out as an idea, we are in the proposal phase, and now this is the opportunity to make it even better. 
It's not perfect, nothing is ever perfect, but we want to make sure that residents are heard. We want you to feel that these proposals are adding value to your communities. They are maintaining the character of your neighborhoods. Uh, we're not taking away anything, but we want to make sure that you have more of what you deserve as a tenant, as an owner, as a commuter, as a pedestrian, as a bike rider, everyone that lives and works in our borough. So that is our opportunity with today's public hearing. And I know my team has additional questions on some of the details, but again, details are important. And so I, I ask and encourage everyone to take a deeper look at this proposal. Look at this entire PowerPoint, um, all of the four buckets, as well as the 18 recommendations, and make sure that you completely understand what is happening, what is being proposed, and also give us your input on how we can make this even better. So I thank you, DCP. Thank you to the team uh, for your time, and we look forward to our continued conversation. Yes. Yes. So thank you. So we're now going to the next part of the public hearing, which is the public to speak. I'm going to go in order of those. So also, if you want to speak, please put your hand up. I'm monitoring the chat. I will ask you to unmute yourself. Um, the first speaker is going to be Karen Argenti. Karen, if you could unmute yourself. Yes, hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm our president, Juton, and, and uh, Sam. Hi, guys. Um, in recent years, we have frequented, we have frequent and increased rain events, or the new normal, with catastrophic flooding as a result. Our city has been experiencing more severe weather, more events, severe weather, events, weather events than surrounding areas. Did you know that the, did you know that the temperature of the equator never gets higher than 80 degrees because it is surrounded by green and wetlands with 140 inches of rainfall? Our 50 inches of rainfall is more intense and has higher temperatures that cause extreme storms because of the 72% impervious surfaces. Of course, we don't have 72% in the Bronx, but that's a general collection for the whole city. The economic proposal removes private open space and adds more building on site for stores, offices, warehouses, despite existing high vacancies in other places. Since this replaces green open space with imperviousness and uses cement, concrete, and iron, it creates more CO2, exasperating the heat island effect. Not carbon neutral at all, but more carbon. The carbon neutral, economic, and soon to come housing city of yes proposals do not get to our climate goals, but instead remove protections we currently have. Instead of the costly treatment that increases CO2 at our sewer plants, we need to use gray water to increase trees, green infrastructure, the restoration of wetlands, and open and permeable gardens for less carbon. This is a more difficult task than the previous one of creating carbon, um, and therefore uh, more critical. In fact, each of the city of yes asks for decentralization. We don't need more growth around every part of the city. That's why we are a city. Um, and then there's this uh, question that I have, if maybe somebody could answer that at some point. How does the text change proposal for the City of Yes on carbon neutrality or City of Yes on economic opportunity impact, interact, enable, or trigger sections of the City of Yes on housing opportunity text changes? Based on this question, specifically explain the campus proposal in City of Yes on economic opportunity to the city of yes on housing opportunity. Aside from NYCHA, what other housing types will be changed? Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. I heard the second heard part the of the question, part of but I didn't hear the first part. The first part of the question is how, well, I didn't think you were gonna answer my question, so um, how does the text change proposal for the carbon neutrality for, on, for economic opportunity impact, interact, enable, or trigger sections up on the housing. And then the second part is all about what besides NYCHA does the campus 
project's section impact. Thank you, Karen. So, yeah, we're not actually having city planning address direct questions, but I will believe that they will be addressing all the public feedback that they hear during other testimony. So thank you, Karen. So going to the next speaker is Laura Spalter with Ken Brown uh, on deck. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, Laura. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Laura Spalter. Today I am speaking on behalf of the Broadway Community Alliance. City planning states that zoning often presents a barrier to opening, operating, and expanding a business in New York City. There is good reason for that. There are many good reasons why expanding commercial businesses in traditionally residential, low-density neighborhoods will alter the character of those neighborhoods and negatively impact the quality of life of residents. By their very nature, commercial businesses are accompanied by increased garbage, deliveries, traffic signage, and the like. Um, we oppose creating a process for allowing more corner stores in residential areas that potentially allow retail and office commercial developments on any residential property within 100 feet of a corner. We oppose the proposal to increase allowable uses, square footage, and employees for home businesses. We oppose proposed changes developed by the Mayor's Office of Nightlife for live music and entertainment because of noise and other potential unintended consequences we are living through cuts to our police departments and other enforcement agencies. Will this change create more demands on those already taxed agencies? We oppose proposed changes to NYCHA and other campuses for commercial development and additional infill development that will result in greatly reduced open space. Um, I leave with this question. We all recognize the importance and need of helping small businesses. They have to contend with high rents, competition from illegal street vendors, rampant retail theft with no real consequences, and a myriad of confusing regulations. How do these changes help them? How is expanding commercial areas helpful when we currently already have so many vacancies in our commercial areas. What if there was another way to accomplish what we want instead of these huge cookie cutter five borough zoning text changes? Um, changes that we could more uh, tell what if there would be any unintended consequences. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you for your testimony, Laura. Looks like Ken Brown is not on the call anymore, so we're gonna go to Ariel Peters as the next speaker. Good Ariel, if you wanna unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, you can begin, thank you. One of New York City's highlights is the vibrant culture that is unique to New York that has been ingrained into the growth of New York City. With the growing population, we continue to deal with different lifestyles. There have been events such as the Cultural West Indian Day Parade where members of the Steel Pen teams were having difficulty practicing before their upcoming event. 311 calls throughout the New York City boroughs that have affected different events individually and throughout the summers. At times, residents can feel that we are being that we are prioritizing commerce over communities and residents. In support of nightlife in our goals, in goal two, I'm looking at um, number nine in support of nightlife. Um, I would like to know, 
common sense rules seem kind of vague. What is the idea of what is being considered rules as it pertains to noise complaints, indoor and outdoor events taking place? And also, how do we support nightlife without silencing the vibrancy of New York City's culture? Thank you for your testimony, Ariel. So that is the last speaker that we have. Is there anyone else on the call, on the virtual or in person that would like to speak? If so, please put your hand up. Or you can unmute yourself and you can speak. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you identify your name? Thank you. On the community board. The question I have about the home businesses, I, I see what you're trying to attempt to do, but my primary concern is one. I think um, one of the speakers just mentioned it is traffic, foot traffic that coming to the community. People buy homes because they want to be uh, in residential neighborhoods, because they want it to be residential, because they want to be away from commercial property, and because they're looking for a certain quality of life. Now, if we're talking about expanding, um, to include home-based business. What are we looking at? Are, are we looking at signage on properties? Um, what type of volume are we looking at in terms of um, people coming back and forth through the neighborhood? Um, and how do we control any of that? You know, I'm trying to understand what that will look like in a neighborhood that have attached homes and um, a number of them are um, decided to do uh, work from home. I mean, if you're saying it's a property here, it's a tech company of some sort where a person comes to the inside, close the door and work, and no one knows, knows what's going on, I think that's absolutely fine. Talk about something where there's a volume of people going back and forth between the neighborhood, that creates a little problem. If you're talking about signage in front of the homes, saying that this is a, this type of business, that presents a problem too, because it then changes the fabric of that community. So. I'd like for it to be a little more clear and defined as to what are we looking at when we talk about home-based businesses and what will the neighbors, people who live there, don't have a business in their home, you know, what is that going to look like for them and that neighborhood? Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Are there any other speakers that want to speak at this time? My name is Maria Caruso. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was um, going to address the question about number five, which was the enable commercial activity on the upper floors. And um, I would imagine that that is the same for uh, upper for commercial space being changed into residential space as well. I would imagine it's both. Um, it's going to go both ways. So I was just wondering if, um, I know that the city has a big problem with uh, affordable housing. That is a big, big issue. And I was just wondering if um, each of the boroughs is going to be dealing with that situation on an equal basis. And as far as, like, for instance, Manhattan, a lot of businesses have moved out of Manhattan since COVID. And so there are a lot of commercial buildings that are uh, unoccupied now by businesses. And since there is such a big issue with uh, affordable housing, might there be some consideration to put affordable housing in those spaces and not just, um, you know, put it in or unequally distributed into the outer boroughs. So that's my comment. Thank you, Maria, for your testimony. Are there any other speakers who want to testify at this time? Hearing none. So as there are no additional speakers, this concludes the public testimony portion of the Borough President Vanessa Gibson's public hearing at 3.41 p.m. I want to thank you all for your participation in this public hearing and hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you.